Thank you everybody for joining us today for this book series launch. My name is Kawant Bhopal and I'll just get members to introduce themselves. Martin? Uh, I'm Martin Myers, I'm at the University of Nottingham. Carl? Hi, I'm Carl Kitching, I'm at the University of Birmingham. Joe? Hi everyone, uh, Joe Whelan and I'm at Trinity College Dublin. Brilliant, thank you. So Martin, Carl and I, and Kenzo, who sent his apologies, unfortunately, he can't make it today. We were approached by Policy Press to actually think about a series which would address issues of social justice, and hence the name, Key Issues in Social Justice, Voices from the Frontline. One of the things that we were particularly interested in in the current climate was addressing the ways in which society has changed, especially the rhetoric and narrative around social justice and what it means in, in current present times. So for example, we've had Brexit, we've had the, we had the election of Donald J. Trump, but we've also had a rise in the far right, not just nationally, but globally and internationally. So especially in Europe. And we've also at the moment had the election of the new prime minister in the UK, Liz Truss, who has already shown us that this government is going to be very much interested in issues to do with the far right. So we were particularly keen and we felt that it was very pertinent to think about the ways in which social justice as a concept has actually changed and how it's moved and how it is, how the rhetoric around it is very different in terms of the social, economic and political climate. So we'll be very keen to address these issues. That was the first thing we were interested in. Secondly, we felt, uh, we felt as though individuals who, who are themselves from marginalized communities, uh, be, and marginalized is defined very broadly, and we ask authors to define that themselves. So be it race, be it class, be it gender, be it sexuality, be it age, be it disability. We felt that these particular authors were underrepresented within writing and publication. So we also wanted to not only give voice to their concerns around issues of social justice, but also to give them a platform because they are from marginalized backgrounds in order that they have the freedom to express the issues that they feel are pertinent to their work, especially themselves being from marginalized communities because the publishing model itself is very much focused around what we would term the elite, white middle-class modes of thinking, and white middle class modes of intellectual scholarship. So a key issue for us was to address that in terms of the background of the scholars that we have published. So I'm really proud to say that we have the first two um, books that have been published and we have the authors with us today who are going to talk about their works. And what's really, really important is the ways in which the authors themselves have used the research to inform issues of social justice. So first of all, I'm going to start, we're going to start with Joe. and forgive me, I'm just bringing up my notes if that's okay. So Hidden Voices, Lived Experiences in the Irish Welfare State provides a unique contribution to the series. And what it does is it exceptionally well is critically explores the policy discourses within the Irish context by focusing and giving voice to a marginalized group. That is the Irish poor who are welfare recipients. And again, the, an under-researched group. Drawing on powerful and compelling empirical research, Joe looks at those living in poverty. He's able to bring together the real experiences of respondents to life and what it actually means in terms of being poor. Each chapter eloquently draws on the Irish context, which is contextualized with relevant literature. Chapters also focus on empirical research on, margin, on the marginalization and liminality, the work ethic, welfare conditionality, compliance, and indeed impression management. And what's particularly good about this book is that what Joe does is he expertly explores the welfare imaginary, a term actually, Joe, which I think is fantastic and I love. And he looks at the ways in which this research has taken place actually within the context of the pandemic. So he provides an, an original contribution to debates on poverty within the Irish context. It's very clear, it's sharp, and it pulls a punch. And I particularly um, felt it was a huge pleasure reading it 
in terms of what it contributes. And then the second authors, we have Rob who is with us and unfortunately Vicky can't be with us today. So Rob's going to talk about their book, Transformative Teaching and Learning, which explores the important hidden stories of transformative learning and teaching, focusing on further and adult education and how this impacts on the lives of students, their families, the local and wider communities. And again, th this book is very eloquently written and the key strength of it is the profound and compelling case studies which show the depth of experiences of students from diverse backgrounds and also those of teachers who support them. Each of the chapters eloquently draw on different aspects and themes based on these case studies. Smith and Duckworth expertly bring together the key issues in how transformative education can contribute significantly to a social justice agenda. I think that this book provides a hugely important and original contribution to debates on further and adult education. It's very clear and indeed it's challenging in that it centers the importance of why a socially just society is one which must ensure that all groups are included, especially in their rights to a decent quality education. So you can probably tell that these two books are absolutely, um, well, brilliant in the sense that they are, they are very new and original, but they also contribute to the key issues that we as the editors are particularly keen on addressing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass on to Martin, who wants to say a little bit, and then Martin will pass on to Carl, and then Joe will talk about his book, followed by Rob. So over to you, Martin. Thanks, Carl. Um, I was really going to keep it very brief, as I'm, I'm much more interested in hearing from the authors than, than uh, saying much about the series. I think you, you've covered the um, the scope and the intent of why we were interested in doing this book series in the first place very, very cogently. I think one of the things I wanted to flag up is that, you know, as Carol just said, we see it's very much intended to give voice to people who are underrepresented in a lot of academic literature. Um, and I think that goes, um, so in, in putting the series together, it goes a bit beyond what the content of the books themselves. We, we also spent time sort of thinking about the academic publishing models that would do best in terms of promoting the sort, the sort of books we wanted to see published. Um, I think one of the things that ha happens is within academic publishing, we often find a lot, there are a lot of accounts of marginalized groups of people, of people who, who are underrepresented. Um, but those books often aren't the means by which their voices get heard. They, they, they tend to be published in order to appear on a university library shelf. So they're incredibly expensive and they tend to be only ever sold to university libraries. I think that's a, yeah, it's a crying shame, basically. Uh, so one of the things that we were pleased with is that the, the series is it's supported by uh, by policy by Bristol University Press, who themselves have a long-standing commitment to publishing around issues of social justice. And in particular, they, they agreed to publish either immediately or very, very quickly uh, paperback editions of, of the books. So in principle, and I still feel they're expensive, um, and I think that, that reflects the realities of publishing, where their books are, they're, they're meant to be read, they're, they're books that people are meant to have in their hands. Um, and so and yeah, basically sort of read inside and outside of academia. Um, so really from my perspective, I'm much more interested now in hearing from Joe and Rob, um, sorry, and Carl, and I'll pass on to Carl um, to say something as well. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, I suppose, yeah, just to echo what Carl and Martin have said, really, um, I think we've got two fabulous books um, in the series already and, and more to come, which I'm sure Carl will say more about. But uh, yeah, I think the, the very nice thing about the book series is that it, provi it provides a platform and creates a platform for um, scholarship from people who might otherwise be under who are underrepresented um, in the academy. Um, and I would say as well, we've got we've got you know, um, it's it's really nice to see work coming through from doctoral um, early career research as well. I think that's a really really important part of of the series too. And um, I really applaud um, all the authors uh, present today. Uh, well, it's it's Robin and Joe, I guess, but everybody who's contributing to the series because we really do welcome a range of different topics and a range of different voices. So yeah, um, without further ado, I'll hand back to Carolyn.
thank you very much indeed, Martin and Carl, for that. So I think I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm really excited that we have Joe Whelan with us. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Martin. Um, and thanks everybody for coming along. Um, I suppose before I start, I know that we're, we're kind of we're here to discuss the substantive content of, of the books, but um, I do just want to start by acknowledging and thanking the support I've had in the writing of the book um, from the series editors, but also from Policy Press. I'm reluctant to begin naming people because the list is long and I, inevitably I leave somebody out. But uh, a book like this doesn't just uh, arrive on the bookshelf in a vacuum. It, it's contributed to by many, many people besides the author. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the, the work and, and the support that's gone into to helping me uh, produce uh, my best possible work uh, for the book. And it's great to be part of this series of books as well for all the reasons that um, our editors have, have outlined. Um, so I just wanted to start by acknowledging everybody that's contributed to the book in, in many different ways. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge Fred Powell as well, Professor Fred Powell, um, who wrote the foreword for the book, um, which was a very generous thing for him to have done. And um, I think uh, kind of sets up the book very nicely at the beginning and um, is, a, is very much a compliment to the editor's preface as well, uh, which I think, you know, again, adds to the overall uh, dynamic of the book and I suppose delineates the, the series and kind of um, inaugurates the series as a, as a, a project in scholarship. Um, so now that the thank yous are out of the way, I suppose I better talk a little bit about what I've written. Um, um, so look, it's I'm not going to do a presentation. I really just want to talk informally. Um, I'm hoping that there'll be some questions for me at the end and that we can maybe have a bit of a discussion. Um, but I suppose primarily this is a book about lived experience and that's not going to be a surprise to anybody that's read the title. Um, so, you know, hidden voices, lived experiences in the Irish welfare state. Um, and it's about the lived experiences of persons that are not often heard from um, in, in, in the uh, context of scholarship. Um, there's lots of research on welfare, there's lots of research on poverty. Um, it often takes econometric forms. Um, it seldom champions the voice of those who uh, have experienced or are experiencing um, welfare recipiency uh, or poverty. Um, that's changing. Um, it's certainly a space that's growing very rapidly in, in the context of the UK and there are many colleagues there who I've taken lots of inspiration from um, and it's also a growing area of scholarship in Ireland so uh, lots of my colleagues here now are beginning to engage in that very important uh, type of work where the voice of, of people who are directly affected by the issues that are being researched is placed uh, front and centre. Um, so it's a book about lived experience and it's a book about lived experience because as a scholar, um, I firmly believe in the importance of lived experience as part of a, what I call a holistic evidence base. So it's not to, it's not to suggest that other forms of experience uh, or other forms of knowledge are not uh, valuable um, or it's not to denigrate econometric knowledge, um, but it's to say that if we are to create policy that is going to be truly uh, beneficial to those who are directly affected by it, then we need to hear from people as well as what, as well as measuring, we need to hear from people, we need to hear what people's lived experiences are like. Um, so I hope in that context that the book is um, a fitting contribution to the series, uh, which is looking to champion voices from the front line, but in the context of those who author the work, but also in the context of the research on which the work is based. Um, uh, and I hope it's a it's it's a good opening book uh, to to this series. Um, so the book uh, is focused on Ireland. It's focused on welfare recipients in Ireland. Um, it's focused on qualitative research. So um, I spoke to nineteen people. Um, that can be something that's difficult to sell to some publishers because they think quantitatively about knowledge. And if you've only sp spoken to nineteen people, well. You know, they may question whether that's a valid approach to, to research or not, but I suppose part of my mission in writing the book was to champion this particular type of approach to research, which values depth uh, of understanding 
um, over and above breath. Um, so the book questions um, how welfare in Ireland is uh, experienced. So we have we have lots of work that questions the way in which welfare is discussed, debated, and conceived. Um, but this book, I think, uh, is important in that it also questions and um, gives a, a sense of how welfare is uh, experienced in the Irish context. And if you read the book, you will see that uh, much of what's to be found in it are not my words, but are in fact the words um, and the stories of the poor, of the marginalized, of the people who came forward and agreed to talk to me in the social context of an interview for an hour of their lives. Um, and so in that way, the book is very much uh, a vehicle for the transmission of their words, of their stories, of their lived experiences. And, and in many ways, I see myself more as a facilitator of that particular project than an author. Um, so being able to bring those voices um, to the fore in the work that I do, um, and then I would hope that that would potentially feed into how policy um, is, is designed. So that's the kind of the key mission for the book. That's what I hope to achieve was to put front and center the voices of persons um, who are not often heard from um, so that we can we can uh, hear their stories um, and that can feed into a, a holistic evidence base for, for, for policy making. Um, in terms then of the things that I'd like to see come out of the book, or if I was to say, for example, have a set of policy recommendations arriving, arising out of the work that I've done, so the writing of the book and the larger project uh, of speaking to people in the context of their experiences of receiving welfare. Um, you know, the first recommendation I have will not be a surprise based on what I've said so far, and that's that lived experience as a form of knowledge needs to be a part of a holistic evidence base. It needs to feed into policy. We need to honor the stories uh, of people. We need to honor people's lived experiences and we need to allow that to have a hand uh, in shaping policy. Um, I also think in my specific context is welfare and welfare recipiency, um, that there are some normative or sort of, um, there are some sort of normative assumptions about what life must be like uh, for those receiving welfare. And these are often conflated with things like uh, idleness um, or laziness and so on. When in actual fact, life for those receiving welfare, it's complex, it's nuanced, it can be intensely challenging. And I think there's a job of work to be done to reframe welfare as a social good so that those assumptions about uh, persons receiving welfare can be changed in the welfare imagine can, can be changed in the way that people think about um, welfare recipiency in general. Um, if you read the book you'll also find that the people I spoke to for the most part suffered great material disadvantage so deprivation of material disadvantage was writ large in the experiences of the people I spoke to um, and that's because although by some metrics in Ireland we have a generous welfare system um, in other ways we don't um, and the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, the value of a working age payment to an adult um, is indexed below the at risk of poverty rate and um, so therefore a recommendation that I would have if I was to frame it as such is that we need to think about how welfare can lift people out of poverty as opposed to maintaining them in poverty. And so I believe that the rates of welfare we pay to people should be indexed to the at risk of poverty rate so that we go back to the idea of a basic minimum um, as given by T.H. Marshall, that people are entitled to a basic minimum um, below which uh, they, they shouldn't fall. Um, the other thing I would suggest is that the way we do welfare conditionality in the liberal welfare states in particular in Ireland is, is a sort of a strange welfare state, but it relies heavily on liberal tendencies. Um, this is also something that we need to think very strongly about, um, because we attach conditions to the receipt of welfare, which are often about encouraging people to seek work. Um, but in actual fact, the conditions that we attach to the receipt of welfare can be so um, so difficult for people to manage as an aspect of their life that the outcomes uh, they, they are intended to produce are often not what, not what happens at all. And in actual fact, people can suffer um, not only the indignity associated with those conditions, um, but also um, poor mental health um, and, and other challenges that are brought on by having to uh, consistently maintain and manage their claims. So, um, you know, from speaking to people as part of this research, I would strongly suggest that as part of how we 
imagine the doing of welfare, we need to um, reimagine the conditions that we attach to welfare. So that welfare ultimately can be reframed and reconstituted as a valuable and necessary social good. Um, I think, you know, if we cast our minds back to the architects of the British welfare state, so if we think of uh, welfare as being from the cradle to the grave in, 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 um, in the context of beverage, or if we think about um, people like T.H. Marshall's right to a basic minimum, we've fallen a long way um, from that idea of welfare. Now, I must also say that that's, that's a simplistic um, welfare, uh, welfare narrative in that the British welfare state was uh, propped up many ways by Britain's, uh, Britain's role in the world as an empire, um, you know, and there's often a sense that that gets forgotten when we think about the golden age of the welfare state. Well, it was paid for um, through, through um, the fact that Britain was an empire. Um, but nevertheless, the ideas were sound, the social democratic ideas that underpinned the Beveridgian welfare state were sound. And I feel that, um, you know, in some ways, a step back would, would be a step forward uh, at the juncture that we are currently at. Um, finally, I suppose in finishing up, I finished the book by looking at COVID. So this book didn't set out to be a contribution to the COVID scholarship, but we all had our worlds changed uh, irrevocably by, by COVID. And so uh, it was something that I needed to acknowledge um, in, in the context of the book. Um, and I do that uh, towards the end of the book. Um, and I think what COVID has shown us is that the value uh, of a strong social safety net in times of crisis cannot be underestimated. Um, and therefore, I think there's a lesson in that because we undoubtedly face more crises, um, whether that's the environmental catastrophe that we're all facing or whether that's perhaps more pandemics. Uh, we need to ensure that we have a strong social safety net that can meet those challenges as they emerge. Um, and indeed, we need to uh, offer um, new ideas of how to do welfare that are sustainable, that are uh, ecologically and environmentally conscious. Um, and I think, you know, we learned that lesson very sharply uh, during the onset of COVID. Um, so that, you know, I, I feel again, in reconstituting, in reimagining a, a welfare state, um, we should also think about how we future-proof that welfare state um, so that we are ready and prepared for the crises that we undoubtedly uh, will face in the coming decades. Um, so I, I think I, I'll probably leave it at that. I don't know if I quite made it to 10 minutes. Uh, I hope that I have. Um, so yeah, that that's the sort of the goal and the ambition for the book. Um, and I'd be delighted to take any questions or, or any comments that you have at, at the end of the session. So, so thank you, everyone. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. That was absolutely brilliant. You see, I'm in a really advantageous position because I've read both the books from cover to cover. Um, and I thought that that, Tracy that you gave was just a, a fantastic summary of it. Hello there, Rob. Is it me now? Hello. Questions for John? We're going to take the questions at the end, if that's okay. okay. okay that's, that's so I'd just like to introduce you now, everybody, to Rob, who is going to, uh, unfortunately, Vicky can't be here, but he's going to be talking now about their book on transformative teaching and learning. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, Cal. That's fabulous. And, and thanks, Joe, for your uh, talk. That's really interesting. And your framing at the beginning, you know, I think it's so important to do that acknowledgement of the, the production of knowledge. You know, it isn't, it's not an individual enterprise. It, it is about people working together. So I'm speaking kind of as, you've got to imagine Vicky, Professor Vicky Duckworth is with me. She was a, um, she was my other half in this project. And the book is really focused on um, a, a kind of a, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it was a kind of a journey because it was a, it's about five years uh, of, of research together. Uh, our, a project that was funded by UCU, uh, the, the Union of Further Education Teachers Union. Um, and they did it, they gave us some money, not a huge amount, but enough to, to, to allow us to, um, get our feet under the table and really get our teeth into this research. I think the echoes are really striking actually when when we focus on uh, voice because um, again it's almost a cliche but the there is a, a dearth of, um, of research into further education 
further in adult education really compared to schools in this country, uh, in England, I'm talking about there, specifically England. And um, more than that, actually, I mean, the, uh, the book is in response to, I think it's a, in a way, it's like a creed occur. I came through further education myself. And my starting point for a discussion around the current policy context is always incorporation. Because this, the, the model of the <laughs> so-called freestanding entrepreneurial institution that then has to sort of, um, well, it's supposed to, it's supposed to earn money in an entrepreneurial way, but the funding is always, it's always centralized. And then the government starts attaching strings to how the funding goes. We're now seeing that in schools in this country, academization and free schools, but also HE. I mean, where I work is increasingly like further education, not the same. Um, so the starting point was my experience of that, Vicky's experience of that, but we wanted to do a build a counter narrative. And that's because the, 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 con the, the policy is so dominated by the kind of quantitative data that Joe referred to. You know, the policymakers like numbers, they dislike ambiguity. They talk about uh, the further education sector. It's not a phrase that I use because I think it's meaningless. It's like, it's not just apples and oranges, it's apples, oranges, mangoes, kiwis, tomatoes, you, you know, you name it. It, it. It's so broad because it includes offender learning as well as all sorts of training, work-based training, vocational training, uh, academic retakes. You have further education colleges uh, who are a part of that, but you've also got, because it's been marketized, um, private training providers because it's competitive so we wanted to break out of this the strangulation of the, the skills discourse that really dominates a lot of the talk in the particular policy about further education and try because i spent 10 years writing about that in a critical way and um, i've got to say I wish I had the optimism to think that anything we do, <laughs> any research I've been involved in or anything I've written might actually influence policy makers. I don't know, possibly, but I, you know, at the current time, most likely not, do you know what I mean? But that's because we have definitely gone backwards, Joe, in, in this country. Um, so we wanted to provide a counter narrative because, you know, when, when the, the terms that underpin neoliberal uh, instrumentalism and the way it thinks that education is all about employment. Those, you know, words like productivity, about um, floor targets and skills and progression, and even actually meritocratic notions of talent. When they've been forgotten 50, 100 years from now, if we're still, the planet's still going, the, the desire of some human beings to engage with others and facilitate the conditions in which personal development takes place, which if you like, is, is, is a definition of what education might be. The co-production of that, the working together of the teacher and the student, those narratives will still be burning brightly in, in people's hearts, I think. And, and really that's what this book is trying to focus on. And that's why we use this term transformative. We, 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 Avoid the idea that this is something you can define and nail down because at the heart of it, again, are a, a series of narratives, stories we interviewed and talked to. We don't use the word interview, actually, because it, they were chat, they were discussions. Um, we shared some of our experiences and we talked to, to a lot of different people. We also got different views on those interviews from the wider public because of the project website because it was you know it went on for five years we used video a lot in it so the book proceeds through in a kind of it's quite linear i suppose in a kind of linearish way uh, you know the context the policy context and then how we put the research methodology together which we describe in particular ways uh, and then and then the um, you know the literature what the literature say about what's going on and then at the heart of it the, the main chapter is, is the voices as you were saying the voices of the teachers and the students and in a couple of cases employers and parents um, because we were talking about all sorts of all the courses further education you know it also means degree foundation degree you know access course but also um, pre-16 qualifications 16 to 18 qualifications. So there's a massive range and I think the voices are the things that are so 
are so powerful. When when you use video, uh, there's a way of you you can you can stop relying on the written word as a way of communicating your human experience. Um, and, and I think that's one of the powerful things about using video. So it is supposed to be kind of um, it, it 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 draws in you know the emotion. That emotion is an important aspect of, of education. That we, we talk about affect, and it was it was powerful. And you'd be interviewing people and with Vicky. I mean, Vicky is fantastic. at uh, social. Uh, she's much more kind of outgoing, and, and I think than I am. And I think that was maybe when we worked together perhaps well. But we would get uh, an atmosphere, and people would be sharing experiences, and it would become quite emotional because that people were often. That when you talk about further education in England, you're talking about people who may feel that they've been written off by the education system. They've come out without the, the kind of baseline qualifications of five weeks or whatever, whatever it is. They come in thinking that they are failures or having been told that they're failures. So the first um, the first task of further education teachers, if, if education is going to become something that individuals can harness a hope, uh, harness, they can harness an educational experience to a, a hope for the future, really, but, you know, it becomes something meaningful rather than something alienating, you know. If, if that's going to happen, then you have to, further education teachers have to build trust and confidence. It has to be, they have to affirm students. Um, and we get this thing repeatedly, and it does often come down to not, sometimes it's uh, individual student, uh, teachers who are named, you know, I mean, I could, I've got some of the uh, voices in my head still, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a photographer from Ramsworth, a, a, a bloke called Herbert, who, was a, uh, who left school with no one CSE, I think. He's a bit older than me. Uh, and he had an undiagnosed dyslexia. So he tells his story, you know, he's a photographer now. He's got an exhibition in central Birmingham, actually, in one of the galleries now. And he tells the story. And the pivot, the pivot seemed to be uh, at Sandwell College, which is in West Brom. And it was a, a dyslexia tutor who said to him, oh, dyslexia is an advantage for a creative person like you. And, and for him, this was like a massive um, a kind of a boost to his identity. And he says it was her, you know, it was her. And, and he, he names her, which I think is a fantastic thing, but it, it says it, it's a testimony to the power of, of an educational relationship. Just as an educational relationship can damage people if someone is put in a box, if someone is written off, if someone is told you haven't worked on it, you know. So we, we go through the book. I think towards the end, I'm looking at the time. But towards the end, we, we look at um, a range of ways of theorizing this. Oh, we were conscious of not wanting to nail it down as it equals this, because in, in our research, it didn't. You got for some people, for, for example, there was a young lad, 16 year old, had been excluded from school for, for anger management issues. And for him, it was about the idea that he could learn simply and that he, he thought he was a good learner. And we, we actually went around, we interviewed his mum in a little house, council house in Bloxwich. And he appeared at the door with a folder, you know, and he opened the folder and said, Look at that. Look at that handwriting. And you could see he was experiencing pride in his work in a way that maybe he'd never done before, you know. So for him, it was that. For others, someone on access to HE program, for example, it was a, it was life changing. It was the scales falling from the eyes. You know, the sort of, sort of experience of free air talks about conscientization. She came to identify. She, she was called Claire. She came to identify that the reason she was she didn't feel good at school wasn't about it, it was it was stuff projected onto her, which was connected to her social class and her gender. You know. And, and that actually she had, you know, limitless potential, but had been put in boxes and put in categories. So you can see there's a kind of a continuum there. It means different things for different people. For some people, it becomes about just individual, an individual achievement. But as I think has already been mentioned I think, by, by Carol at the beginning, for a lot of them, these the students in particular are going back and they're not leaving their, their communities. They're a part of their communities. And, and, and it feeds into what then happens. We talk about it, that ripple effect thing. You know. So sisters, cousins suddenly are thinking that university is in reach, for example, like drawing in another one. So um, what we were trying to do then was isolate these really positive things to feed back 
to, I mean, I've got to say that the, the, the way the book is written, it is for an, it's for an audience. I'm hoping that it is academic as well, but it is aimed at, at, at further education practitioners because by God, they need resources of hope because it's been, it, we've had 12 years of targeted uh, underfunding work. And, and it's been terrible. And I, th I see that as coming out of a, a meritocratic view of some people have talent, people like our former prime minister, believe it or not, uh, whereas other people don't. It's that bell curve stuff, isn't it? Or the IQ stuff, or, and race and social class are, are sort of uh, fair game. You know, they push to one side as explanations for some of the effects that we see. And it's a counteractor. We come to, I'll, I'll move on to the recommendations. I mean, the recommendations. Are that further education should be viewed in a non linear way. It's all underpinned by the idea that you should be, we should be indexing funding to need because the people who go into further education, they need more resources, not less. You know, they need more, but they get less. I've done more research recently which shows, you know, further education now is picking up the, the casualties from the, the, the removal of safety nets. Of social care in this country, you know, they, colleges feed children, feed young people every morning. They sometimes buy them uniforms. You know, so um, more funding, obviously. The idea of non-linearity, that the, the, the further education curriculum has to incorporate an element of including identities, the identities of students. It needs also to be focused on local needs because it, it's all geared up to centralise, you know, skills discourse stuff. And they manipulate every year the funding cycle. So another thing is to break that annual thing because it's a straitjacket. No businesses could run on the way that uh, further, edu further education colleges and providers are supposed to run. They couldn't because they have, they've got these really tight parameters which they have to meet. Um, and I think that's it. I think I've probably spoke for 10 minutes or more. So. I better pause. I could go on and on talking about this because it was a big part, big part of our lives for, for sort of five years. Really. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. And I think what you both demonstrated, I think, in the summaries that you've just provided, is first of all the importance of your work, and secondly, the fact that this kind of work is really important, particularly in relation to what we mean and understand by social justice and the rhetoric and discourse that we currently have at the moment in the whole of society and not just the UK is really a move, I, th I think, a move away from that in terms of social justice being important. And the way in which equity is defined is very, very different. And quite often it's the marginalised, and actually not quite often always, it's the marginalised that, that, that miss out. And, you know, this government does not care about those who are living on the margins, be it education, be it poverty, be it the labour market. So I think that this work, you've shown the pertinence and importance of this work and why more of it is actually needed. So thank you so much for those presentations. So we have three questions in the Q&A. Um, and Martin and Carl, if you have questions as well, please do let me know. So forgive me while I read this out. Right, so this is for you, Joe. Firstly, thank you for the work that you do. It's Suzanne Rogers. Thank you, Suzanne. It gives that vital evidence base that's necessary when working in this space and challenging overarching narratives. As we approach our annual budget, and we've got ours tomorrow, actually, <laughs> in Ireland next week, how hopeful is it that the social welfare rates will actually rise to a rate that does lift households out of poverty? Joe, do you think that if the rate, rates don't rise that rec uh, at a level that recognises the increases in basic costs is it because those that rely on social welfare are othered so what do you think of that joe i think it's a very good question uh, firstly and thanks uh, to suzanne for for asking it um before i answer it just thanks to rob as well for his his overview of the book um i really enjoyed listening to you rob um yeah i suppose there's, there's kind of two questions in that really, isn't there? Um, first of all, do I think that the social welfare rate will be raised in the budget to an adequate level? 
needed to lift people out of poverty. Um, you know, I, I, I'm in the realm of speculation here, but kind of going on past form, I, I don't think it will be. I think there will be an increase, but I don't think it will be enough to allay or alleviate poverty. Um, and I think particularly given that we, as I know you are also uh, experiencing a severe cost of living crisis, where effectively the basic essentials that people need, and we're talking about the kinds of things you would use to define absolute poverty, you know, food, clothing, shelter, um, these have become exponentially more expensive uh, in the past six months for a number uh, of reasons. Um, you know, and 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 whether we like it or not, also underpinned by an ideological project, a continuing an ide ideological project. So no, I don't. I think there will be an increase because I think there's a clamoring for this kind of uh, a budget proposal, but I don't think it will be adequate enough to lift people out of poverty in a meaningful way. Um, do I think that's because social welfare recipients are othered? I think that's part of it. Um, you only have to look at how in Ireland we politicize welfare. You only need to look at how the current administration has in the past um, used welfare recipients as a lightning rod um, for for um, in the context of, 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 a, of a leadership race. So for those of you that may not be familiar, um, we had a welfare cheats cheat us all campaign, a public information campaign in Ireland a number of years back where people were encouraged uh, on billboards and through radio ads and so on to um, to effectively ring in and and um, let let the Department of Social Protection know uh, if they knew of people that were cheating uh, the welfare system. So, I mean, you only need to look at how our, our government in the past uh, 10, 15 years or so has treated the area of welfare to know that yes, there is at the level of politics and othering of welfare recipients, a, a conflating of welfare recipiency with the worst uh, and the laziest of tropes, you know, the, the, the lazy job seeker, um, you know, and so on. Um, you know, very much a rhetoric that we've imported perhaps from, from the US and no proliferates in the well, liberal welfare states um, of the global north generally. Um, so yes, I think that that may be one of the reasons why uh, why the rates the rate increases won't be adequate. I also think you know welfare recipients are an easy target. Um, so you know you can you probably get more votes by lowering taxes than you do by increasing social spending. And that's a very simple formula, but it remains true. Um, so there are lots of reasons why uh, welfare can get a nominal increase um, and not necessarily get a meaningful increase in, in the way that it would. Um, and yes, othering does does come into that. And, and, and the thing about othering, and I do address this in the book, actually, it's a practice then that, is, that seeps down to the level of the welfare recipient and is taken up by the welfare recipients who then engage in the othering of other welfare recipients um, because welfare is constituted as being a space of scarce resources and you want to legitimize your claim over and above that of other competing claimants. So you tend to other people that are receiving welfare. And this is something that, you know, certainly comes from the top down and, and then is taken up um, at, at sort of a grassroots level, if you like. Um, so I think, you know, may, maybe that's, somewhat of an answer uh, to, to the two parts of that question. I hope, I hope Suzanne, that, that that helps. Thank you very much, Joe. And I think it's really interesting, and you do this really well in the book, where you expertly demonstrate how welfare is classed, very much so in the ways in which welfare recipients have a stereotype around who a welfare recipient is, and it's very much classed. And I would argue it's raced as well. And I think that those identities have been imported from, one could argue, the US, where we have, there's an image around what a welfare recipient looks like. And, and it is because they're othered, and it is because I think I agree in the sense that, and certainly the English government, I mean, we've got a budget tomorrow, but there is no absolute concern for welfare recipients, and they are considered the lowest of the low, and, and the government is not prepared to invest and as you've rightly said, everyone has the basic right to food, clothing, et cetera, and heating. And unfortunately, we are moving so much away from that. So thank you very much indeed for that. So we have another question. Um, 
let's have a look. Hold on. Okay, it's another one for you, Joe. Is that is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why is lived experience important as a form of knowledge? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, that that I have to show my sons now. You know, um, I think for all the reasons I've said, um, and you know, I'm I'm always cautious to qualify uh, my suggestion that lived experience is important as a form of knowledge by saying that's not to denigrate or diminish the importance of other forms of knowledge. Um, my argument is that lived experience is a much um, maligned form of knowledge that hasn't meaningfully entered the policy making space. And I, I share Rob's uh, kind of concerns that what we do doesn't necessarily feed into policy in the way that we would wish and hope that it would. Um, and uh, we actually had a symposium um, earlier uh, in the year where we discussed uh, lived experience as a form of knowledge. And we had a colleague from Finland who interviewed people who uh, were part of the universal basic income experiment over there um, talking about uh, how they face similar problems and what we would perceive to be uh, you know, a very progressive welfare state. Um, so like, I, I think it's important to say that lived experience is just one form of knowledge, but that it seems to be, um, it seems to be denigrated at, um, to the expense of other knowledges. And I think it needs to be admitted. Um, and the reason I think it needs to be admitted is because narratives are powerful. Um, they elicit in us empathy. They elicit in us the best of human emotion. They, they elicit in us empathy, they elicit in us understanding, they realize that actually we are experiencing a common human experience. You can't get that in a spreadsheet, you can't get that through econometric measurement, you have to hear from people in order to, to be able to elicit those um, best, I would argue, the best of human responses. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a matter of social justice that, that people's voices are admitted as a, as one part uh, of, of a holistic evidence base. Excellent, thank you. I have a question for Rob and then Carl or Martin, if you have any questions, please do let me know. So Rob, I just wanted to ask you about the use of videos and can you specifically tell us what that added? Because as a research method, it's one that quite often people don't use because of ethical reasons and so on and so forth. So could you can tell us a little bit about the use of videos and what it added to your research, please? And if there were any ethical dilemmas within that? I mean, I think there, were, there are constraints around it. There are limitations that it introduces. Um, I'll, I'll start with the kind of obvious ethical thing first. If you, if you think about the nature of our of our project, we we were we were actively seeking people who had positive things to say about their experience, and that is in within a context in which we know there's loads of negative experiences where students are being objectified, talked about in terms of you know the receptacles for skills, you know that really deductive. So. Um, it's a what you call that. I mean, it is an appreciative inquiry, but it's there's an element to that idea that we're getting people who are going to be saying positive things about their institutions and about their experience because that was the nature of the phenomenon we were chasing. That meant that the the ethical dilemmas were around. Um, uh, well, sorry, that meant that they were they were. Uh, we we offered anonymity. If we were going to have anonymity, that then the 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 uh, the data would have been withheld. We would have been anonymized and we wouldn't have used the video. It would have just been an audio thing. But of course, because people were feeling successful and buoyant because of their experiences, they were happy to be, they were happy to be recorded. The ethics then, uh, and, and they were not anonymized, and this was all put completely up front, you know, do you want this or not? And and the ethics then were around. I can think of an example where there's a, a, a young woman talking about her experience of being unemployed and suffering, getting getting locked into a, a cycle of depression, and, and and you know you know breaking down in tears basically during during the talk. We paused the camera, and you know Vicky went and comforted her, you know, and 
do you want to carry on or not? We cut that bit out. So the, the ethics then become in editing, how you edit. You edit for dignity. You take out anything that, and you show that every, every video is shown first to the participant. Do you want anything removed? It's in your, and then you keep an eye on the site. It only happened once. I think we've got 50, 60 videos or more up there. It happened once with one young lad, uh, one of the early ones actually, someone did a, <laughs> wrote some crude commentary. I mean, I think he was poking fun, I think, but it was crude commentary in the comments. But because we got an overview of the site, we'd go in and just knock it out. There was nothing else malicious. Um, and and the videos, are, I mean, you can see which ones are viewed a lot because you, they're on the dashboard. You get them and stuff like so the ethics were, because it's out there forever. I'll tell you one thing which I feel is an ethical aspect of this. And it's the long-term nature of it. I was going to ask Joe about how he chose these participants, because I do feel that we were not researchers in the sense that we're going to dip in and then run off. You know, you fit, you, you're involved and you're involved in the story, the stories of the people that you talk to and what happened. You want to know what happened next. And I know in some cases, some cases, things have been fantastic. People have gone on and now they're teaching or something. You know, they've escaped from some sort of horrible DV situation or whatever. But I know in one or two other cases, it hasn't gone well, you know. The person has, has got involved in drugs or something. And I've, I've inquired of the teacher that we talked to, because it was quite often we were accessed through teachers. Um, what else could I, have I answered your question? Yes, you have indeed. Thank you very much, Rob. And the reason I ask that question is quite often, as a researcher, I kind of refrain from using videos for the reasons that you've just fantastically outlined is that all of those ethical ethical reasons but mainly because of as you've already just said it's always there yeah. it's always going to be there so and i think that's probably why a lot of respondents don't like to be videoed even though an interview is there it's anonymized you can't see them if you listen to it and you and it's anonymized so i think that for me yeah i think it's, you've given me quite a lot to think about <laughs> because i can see the value of it I'd add one other thing, and that again goes with this idea that people were talking about positive experiences. What we were, we sort of thought about the methodologically, if you like, the research became a way of further affirming the positive. We talk about it in terms of positive learner or you know, student identities or whatever. We, it was further affirmation, and um, it was saying, yeah, you know, you're. We recognise this. It was about. It was. It was. So that's the that's the sort of research as social practice, isn't it? It isn't just some kind of academic exercise. You know, we're going in and we're talking about education experiences, kind of you know, trying to trying to enhance the experience, I suppose, or something. You know, we don't we don't see ourselves as neutral in that in that respect, I suppose. But yeah, it's certainly. It certainly wouldn't work in all, with, with all research really, it just wouldn't. And also you've nailed it when you say that it's about what happens after. So, because quite often our research is almost, I mean, one of the feminists years ago described it as, you know, we take hit and run, we, we, we take what we want and that's it. And we leave the individuals in their situations to deal and cope with poverty <laughs> or exclusion and so on. But your research is really good because you, you go beyond that. And I think that's why it's got a unique social justice focus. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, social justice is so under attack, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if anyone's on the, on the edgy Twitter, but the people who sneer about social justice as a sort of motivating force for education, educational practitioners. And, you know, <laughs> look, another piece of research about social justice in inverted commas. I don't know if you've seen that. It's revolting, as well as, the Centre for Social Justice, which is a, an organisation founded by a Tory, I think. They're trying to colonise it, aren't they? The right it's very, that centre is very right wing. Yeah. It's not left wing at all. Yeah. So, Carl and Martin, do you have any questions for our authors? Carl, yeah. would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Carl. Um, thanks, um, Rob and Joe, for, um, again, for the books and for um, really, really fascinating comments on them and, and on the topics. Um, I have two questions actually. One is it, it refers actually to those attacks by governments, whether they're subtle or in more subtle in the Irish case or more direct in the in the UK case. 
depends on the historical period we're in, I guess, whether it's more subtle or direct. Um, I suppose I'm thinking about the, the sort of the broad relationships between both of your books, and I guess one of them is the fact that we're in the wake of constant attacks on the leg legitimacy of public, universal public institutions and universal public services and supports, um, and how they're seen as, how people who are in receipt of them or using them are seen as burdensome, and how the institutions themselves are seen as bureaucratic and ineffective and inefficient and not, not um not meeting the needs of the economy um i guess I, i'm just curious to know what you think are the most powerful counter discourses to those attacks uh, and those appropriations and those sort of the the kind of aggressive nature of some of it um you've mentioned it there rob in relation to edgy twitter but more broadly speaking you know this is a global issue the um the, the center right and the far right have been collaborating a lot around the world. I think Sweden has just elected its first far right led government. Um, you know, so I'm just thinking about what counter, I wonder what your thoughts are and what counter discourses are powerful enough to respond to these constant attacks on the notion of a universal public um, service support institution. That's the first one. I'll come to the second one. Would you like to go first, Rob? Or yeah okay um I, there's a lot of food for thought i think in the in the question carl um and i'd be very reluctant to sort of uh answer by offering a potential counter narrative and maybe it's just because i've become um cynical but i'm i'm not altogether sure what that counter narrative can be anymore because it's not like they haven't been offered or aren't offered continuously but they seem to get little or no traction and um, even after what we've just been through you know even after we've seen demonstrably the necessity for strong public institutions they still find themselves under attack um, and at some point I find myself saying you know maybe these people that are voting for these right-wing parties maybe that's what they want maybe I'm the outlier you know maybe I'm the, the guy that's got it all wrong by wanting a more just and, and, and equitable society um, so I'm, I'm not sure what the counter narrative will be, but I think what the the um, what the sort of the ultimate the ultimate sort of balancing out of these attacks on public institutions might be what the um, the antidote maybe ultimately is necessity. Um, so I don't I don't want to go too far beyond the scope of what I've written in the book, but a, a lot of the scholarship I'm engaged in at the moment. Uh, centers around uh, the idea of post growth um, and the capabilities approach to social policy and um, through things like universal basic services and participation income and so on. Um, and not just because these are lovely things that we want to have, but because they may become a necessity um, in how we organize our economies and societies. Because if we don't change how we organize our economies and societies, and this is particularly true, of course, in the global north. You know we're we're facing uh, an extinction event. Um, so I realize I've gone very macro uh, in my answer to you, but I, I think the narrative may become the necessity to have strong public institutions. Um, that that's where I think we're headed ultimately, um, or we're headed off a cliff. You know, so it's kind of uh, there may be a, there may be the penny may drop at some point that we need to organize differently and that means how do we look after people how can we look after people in a, in a rapidly changing world that was really interesting joe yeah you know like like joe you know i'd hesitate to present a, a counter narrative that's um that i would view as being <laughs> likely to be successful but i know the narr my narrative is is very similar to joe's and that's through someone who's been through the unpleasant experience of brexit in this country i you know i think that neoliberal e economics is on its knees it, there's a massive rift that it's breaking apart before our eyes we've got a new prime minister who's going to lurch us even further to the right but there's massive disputes even within the right wing about whether that model of economics works but for me it's about nation it's about nation any nation on this planet that comes up with an economy which depends on 
the the exploitation and objectification of individuals in a remote a more remote and distant part of the pla planet who either belong to a different social class or have a different skin color it's not good enough is it and uh, the whole channeling funneling of resources both of, of labor and and you know uh, raw materials from some parts of the world into this kind of walled citadel where we won't let people in. Uh, I, I've gone big scale because that's the way I feel. You know, living in a, in a city like Birmingham, our city, it, it's a world city. It's got people from all over the world. When I was when I was 18, I did a gap year in Sudan and I ended up teaching in a little refu a, a refugee school for refugees from a place called Eritrea or Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia border. At the time, there was a war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, but I'd never heard of Eritrea. Well, you know, now I live on a road in Birmingham and there are, there are Eritrean people who I know who live on my road. Well, that's, that's, that to me is a message about how the world has changed. And, and if, you, if you get rid of uh, and productive, productivity depends on nation, doesn't it? You know, all these things, they're, they're connected, connected, it seems to me. Um, I, I think that the plant, the planetary thing is a very powerful, it's a very powerful, uh, powerful discourse. And I'm just, uh, I'm just alarmed that we are swimming in sewage at the moment. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where our government's priorities seem to be. Yeah. Did you have another question, Carl? I did, yeah. Um, thanks, Carl. And just to say, um, I, I do appreciate you can present a counter narrative as if as if that hasn't been tried either and we've seen the results of the last election in the UK for example and how how a, how an alternative was completely attacked by corporate media and everything and that's led to its led to its failure ultimately and um and it it, it reminds me of um I suppose another piece that ties some of your work together is is this idea of scaremongering and stigma and the the old tactics that have been there for forever um, around the public and around public services um, and that David Theo Goldberg has written, recently written a book um, called Dread Facing Futureless Futures, which is which is actually about tracking capitalism and surveillance and suspicion. But it kind of it makes me wonder about what the alternative to, to dread is and kind of that as kind of a as a because I think part of what he's saying is that while um, many parts of the globe have, have lived with dread existentially forever the western wealthy nations haven't in the same way but they are now living with dread partly because of the climate crisis but also because of multiple crises so yeah that as joe mentioned that's that that issue of necessity and that that i think that feeling of dread probably might be a, a means through which community can be built i don't know or is trying to be built so anyway my other question was was just about um Obviously, the book series is, is um, focused on supporting underrepresented academic voices and, and underrepresented issues um, in relation to policy and, and, and the social experience. I just wondered, you know, what, what are your views on what is needed, broadly speaking, to support underrepresented academics and to make the academy more inclusive, whether it's the institutions themselves or broader academic disciplines? Again, a very big question, I know, but just kind of any thoughts that you, you have. You go, you can go first this time, Rob. We'll uh, we'll keep it equitable. Oh, that's right, John. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think it's HEI is a, 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 a wrestling with it, and it's a, it's a it's a huge problem. So the marketization of a, of HE in I'll just talk about England. Um, it's so hierarchical. I work in, in, in an institution which is in this bottom layer. It used to be a polytechnic. So it's kind of, um, we draw all our students from very close to the uh, uh, the city, really. I think it's within really, you know, three quarters or more within a 20 mile radius. Of, 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 and it, and it, in England, it, I don't know what the case is in Ireland, Joe, but in, in England, the, the idea is you go, the middle class, the middle class sort of traditional stereotype is people go to a different city, and kids go to a different city to study. Um, um, I think that also that means that we are our demographic. I mean, for me, it's representative of Birmingham, <laughs> and yet if you look at the staff, and I include myself, um, 
will it's 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 too white still. Uh, I think there's more probably a more variability in terms of social class background. I myself am very middle class, I would say, but I did go to a local comp, which accounts for me having a bit of a burn in the back. So I didn't do a grammar school to be fair. Um, and my background is very much. Uh, I went to a local school which was it was predominantly African Caribbean actually when I started back in uh, seventy four. It's, um, it then quite up in Birmingham we've got a sizable uh, Muslim and Indian population too. So I, I've always worked or learned in a, the, an environment which is very diverse. Uh, and I was shocked when I first came here to see that although we've got teacher education courses uh, and we've been running them for years, and in many classes, you know, most people have got brown skin then the numbers of staff are, are low. I'm, I'm doing it on that basis, you know. Uh, for me, that's that means that there's a decolonizing exercise that we've got to go through. And uh, it's something that I take very seriously. Um, I'm involved in a project around increasing the recruitment, retention and completion of, of, of post-grad researchers from global majority backgrounds. It's, a, it's one of those OFS projects, a big office for student projects. Um, and it means tackling culture and values of staff and even how they think about um, teaching and learning. You know. uh, it, drawing on the stuff from this book, it's the same stuff, it's the same stuff. It's about personal relationships. You know, the number of times that those the, the people we interviewed, you know, again, it sounds cheesy, but this is the lived experience thing. They talked about belief. So-and-so believed in me. That's what they would say. And we didn't prompt them. We didn't have a set of questions. I would say that someone's have believed in and how important that was. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done still. Um, and, and that's a that's a big thing we've got to tackle. You know, I'm a part of that too. Go on, Joe. Thanks, Rob. Um yeah, uh, another another easy one, Carl. Um yeah, I think Rob's point about belief and you know the 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 fact that when we meet people that come from non-traditional backgrounds it can often be that one person or that one conversation or that person who displayed belief so for me then it's a question of how well how do we how do we institutionalize that belief so that it becomes part of policy and it's not just this discrete thing that sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't um I'm conscious sort of in answering this question that there are colleagues in the session that are much closer to, to, to education as a, as a topic than I. So this is perhaps a layman's answer, but I, I do think it comes back to that fundamental difference between equality of opportunity and, and equality of outcome and what we can actually do to um, promote equality of outcome. So, I mean, if you think about, if I, I'm, I'm, I'm in Dublin now, and if we even think about Dublin by postcode, uh, the likelihood is if you go out to the college I work at, you know, you come from one of four or five postcodes in the vast majority of cases. Um, ostensibly, there are opportunities from anyone in Dublin to, to come to, to Trinity and study, um, you know, if they get the points and so on. And there are programs that we run, such as the Trinity Access Program, which tries to promote um, uh, opportunities for people from disadvantaged backgrounds to come and study. Um, but they're a drop really in the ocean, you know, and they're, they're discrete programs that don't capture enough, really. Um, so if we want to promote marginalised voices in education in a general sense, who will then, you know, hopefully go on to become our colleagues in the future, I think, you know, we need a fundamental shift in policy away from a, a meritocratic system based on equality of opportunity and toward a system uh, that's based on equality of access, equality of outcome. That sort of formalizes uh, what Rob was talking about in terms of, you know, belief. So that belief is there all through the system uh, for persons. Um, you know, and it, it can never be perfect, um, but you would hope that, you know, to speak in economic terms, the conversion rates, should we take such an approach and the outcomes that would that such an approach would produce would be conducive uh, to allowing more of our marginalised colleagues to succeed, you know. Um, 
So, yeah, I'm not sure, Carl, if that's a very satisfactory answer. I have a feeling you probably have a much more nuanced um, answer you could offer. But Well, even if I had one, Joe, <laughs> would people listen? But that's another story. <laughs> Thanks very much, Stuart. Brilliant. Thank you. And Martin, do you have any final questions for our authors, please? Yeah, thanks. Colin. There's one um, <clears throat> sort of slightly speculative question. Um, it was triggered by Joe talking about post-war Britain and the, the the sort of the beverage principles behind the welfare system that were was introduced then. And it, then uh, it's something Rob says later on about um, the way FE colleges are picking up on other social problems and addressing those. As a, here's a speculative question, but I mean, the, the, those sort of principles that underpinned what happened in 1944 or 45, they were very sort of um, consensual. So they went, they cut across parties. If I was being really cynical, you know, you, you could suggest what it was because if after the Second World War and after the First World War, you didn't respond to what had happened to the working classes and you didn't respond to the sort of the misery of the welfare state pre Second World War, I don't know, you could have revolutionary change or something. It was, there was a moment when something had to happen. And it's really just thinking, because you mentioned, somebody mentioned the pandemic, I think, Joe, what are the conditions? And it's, uh, it's a clearly speculative question, but what are the conditions where there would be not just the, the political sort of maneuvering into position, but the, a, a change in sort of public discourse. So when people are thinking about welfare or they're thinking about what they want from their, their services from their education, where that changes towards something that's far more um, well, social justice orientated, uh, far more like what emerged in the immediate aftermath of um, beverage. Um, that's a difficult question, <laughs> but that's, uh, I'm interested in that. There's a lot going on there, Martin. That's true. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I think it's 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 is it would I be right in saying it's not dissimilar to Carl's first question? Are we talking about what? Are we talking effectively about what a counter narrative might be, or is it more? I think the, more about the, so there's a public discourse, isn't there? We, I mean, we can think about the sort of the yeah. political discourse. And I can be really nasty about the Tories, and I can have a go at Labour for being inept. Yeah, I can do, and I can see sort of the grounds by which they would change, and it's probably down to voting and things like that. But what I suppose concerns me more is behind that. There's the there's the public will. There's the public discourse that does or doesn't support what is or isn't happening which does or doesn't buy into people being totally marginalized at times yeah so in effect we're we're dealing with kind of welfare state legitimacy as a question um i i suppose i could start to maybe as opposed to trying to answer you categorically maybe just engage the, the question a little bit um, by drawing on, on something that I do touch on in the book um, and something which Calwin mentioned earlier as well um, and this idea of a welfare imaginary so how do we think about welfare you know um, and you know since the beginning uh, of the neoliberal project and particularly since the 1970s there's been a fundamental shift in the welfare imaginary we've begun to think of welfare quite differently um, you know, under the, the, the policies inaugurated by tax, successive tax or governments in Reagan and the States and so on. Um, so, so therefore the project becomes, well, how do we, how do we change the welfare imaginary again? You know, if it, if it could be changed once, if how we conceived of and thought of welfare was uh, largely positive once, that means it can, it can happen again. You know, it might seem like a, a, um, a, an uphill battle and, and perhaps it is, um, but, you know, evidence would suggest that we can change our thinking on these things. And I'm not so sure either that we have that far to go um, in the sense that if you were to look at the political discourse and rhetoric on its own, you have one sort of evidence for the way in which welfare is conceived of and imagined. But if you were to look at the outcome of surveys like the European Social Survey, you'd be very surprised to see that people, when they're asked, 
actually have quite a positive view of welfare. Um, and even in, in the case of Ireland, for example, at, in the latest round of that survey, um, the majority of people said yes to the idea of a universal basic income, which is, you know, up until recently was sort of la la land in, in policy circles, you know. Um, so I think it's a it's a program of reframing. And again, I touch on this in the book. How do we reframe? How do we begin to talk about welfare? Because if we talk about welfare in a way that is positive, it slowly but surely chips away at what welfare has become. Welfare has become this pejorative word almost. It's almost a slur uh, at this point. Um, so that we need to change the welfare imaginary. And I think in some ways that's a project for politics. Uh, you know, the way in which welfare is spoken about is important, um, but it's also a project for policy because policy ultimately drives the sociological experience that people have so that if we have policies which promote the idea of welfare as a, as a, as a social good and people experience it that way, then that begins to shift back to uh, the, a previous welfare imaginary, you know, the post-war welfare state, the idea of a welfare commons. Um, again, I, this is, you know, wildly speculative on my part, and, and we're really just having a philosophical discussion now and the empirics have sort of left the picture. But, you know, these are the things I think about when I when I think about this kind of thing. Thank you. That's a, that's a good answer, Andrew. Thank you. Rob, did you, I was wondering, because you talked about the what was happening in FE colleges, and some of that seems to be the that's the positive social people doing the things that are value. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna. I was gonna bring in the the, the experience in Chile. Actually, I mean, it, it just seems so extraordinary to me that we are where we are uh, economically and politically, and it, it does seem to me that actually that. You know, I, I do think that the, that it's failing. The model of economy is failing. I know it, it's again, it's it's a well-worn trope, isn't it, that we are in perpetual crisis. That um, the pricing out of the basic, you know, human rights that we talked about. You know, we've got increasing food banks in this country. The you know, none of my kids are ever going to be able to afford a house. Probably, you know, it's just gone off. The the, the student loan book has been sold to a hedge fund. So there's a new shackle. <laughs> I watched a film last night on Netflix of that set in the States and the, 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 pit, the narrative pivoted on a young woman who had a $70,000 student loan. And she, she was on the phone to the actor and, and, and talking about the interest rate and how it had gone up and everything. So she therefore kind of connects up with crime. They're, they're dumping it. But the Chilean experience, I know that we've had the, the referendum didn't work. From what I've heard, that was because it it was a 400 page document which wasn't really actually explained fully to people. But um, that created a crisis eventually because, if, you know, the, if human need isn't answered, eventually people, maybe we'll start getting around. I don't know, it's difficult. Because there are still large areas of our map, according to Britain elects, which are uh, a shaded blue in terms of electoral intention. And that baffles me. Really. <laughs> I can't explain. Fantastic. So I think I'm going to, um, unless there's any other pertinent questions, I think I'm going to stop there. But what I would like to say, first of all, is that if anybody wants to buy the books, there's currently 50% off on the policy website. So please go and buy the books. Uh, and like I said, I've read them both and they're definitely worth buying. In terms of one of the questions was the future for the series. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that we have three probably more actually, authors that will be publishing next year. So we have Paul Warmington, Bazana Shane and Jessica Abrahams. So the three of them will be publishing their books next year. And there are others also in train. Um, so we're really excited about the future of the, of the um, series. Did you have a question, Rob? I don't want to be letting the cat out of the bag, but is Paul's a biography? No, it's not. It's an academic okay. book. Okay. It, it would have been good if it was, right? Well, I, I, maybe I've missed the battle, but yeah, now good, great stuff. Paul and Fazana, fabulous. 
Brilliant. Yeah, so we've got some fantastic writers. Um, and what I was going to also say that is if, if anybody has an idea for a book or you know somebody who would have an idea for a book, just drop me, Carl or Martin an email and then we'll be very, very happy to oblige. Um, the process is that you write a proposal, then it goes out for review. And then I'm majorly involved in the editing process and reading the books, as are my colleagues. So just drop us a line if you have an idea for a book, because we're really, really keen to continue to promote the series. And um, I don't know if Martin and Carl want to say something, but I certainly just I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This has been one of the most intellectually engaging discussions that I've had for a very long time. So I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I've enjoyed it so much and I can't believe we've been doing this for one and a half hours. So I just really, really hugely want to thank Joe and Rob, not just for writing such fantastic books, but also for the responses to the questions that they had. Massive thanks to my colleagues, to Carl and to Martin for all their hard work. And a huge, huge thank you to Amber and Policy Press who are behind the scenes for organising everything. So I don't know, Martin and Carl, if you want to say any last words, I can hand over to you before I say goodbye. Well, I, I mean, just to echo that, but to thank you, Carl, because um, we could easily leave this without actually mentioning how much, you know, you, how, how you spearheaded this and really brought everybody together. So just want to thank you on, on everybody's behalf. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Martin, did you want to say anything? I'm not going to repeat it. It's the same thanks to everybody. I mean, really, it's uh, it was a great afternoon. Um, thank you all. It's good. Yeah, absolutely. I have to say, you know, one of the best ways intellectually I've spent my time recently, um, and I'm sure it's the same. It's made given me loads of things. I've written loads of notes, loads of things to talk about, and I'm definitely going to use the welfare imaginary, Joe and your work too, Rob. So I'm looking forward to discussing that with my students. Thank you so much and have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Take care.